took the coat off so Paul could see bright and clear this wonderful shirt. Everybody says, what's wrong with the shirt? I said, nothing's wrong with the shirt. Something's wrong with Paul. <laughs> Boy, I, I haven't gotten that many amens in a long time. <clears throat> and Aaron is the same way. I don't know if Aaron's here, but she says the tide the clashes. It's, it's not true. Um, I do want to say Mike Poppleton will be doing surgery hip replacement on Tuesday, and he's potentially kept us out of the loop on that, hoping that nobody will find out or something like that. So if, if I don't even know if he's here tonight, but if he is, he, you'll never see him the same again. He'll be somewhat different the next time you see him. Uh, so be sure to kind of let him know that. Um, and I do know uh, I've been corrected. I did something inaccurate this morning. When you do that, you have to correct yourself. It's cream of tartar, not tartar sauce. Um, I don't really know the difference. I just know that she said, well, what makes that whip upright is tartar, and she threw it in there. And I, the only tartar I know is tartar sauce. Uh, and, I, and everybody says, well, that don't make sense. Well, neither does vanilla. Have you tasted it? I mean, it tastes nasty, and it makes... So this cooking thing has some things in there, like the English language, that don't make sense. So there's, there's that. Uh, Psalm 13 is where we're going to be tonight, uh, two places, and we're going to keep this short tonight. I know... It's kind of uh, tiring after a day in the potluck, but I had a great time today. I'm starting to feel at home with all these people correcting me all day today. Starting to feel right at home here, and I uh, appreciate everybody doing that, and, and, and uh, it just feels uh, like you're where you're supposed to be. Psalm 13, been read a moment ago. Uh, and, and for many of you, this sermon just doesn't fit with your life, and it's going to be basically boring. So the next, I don't know, 15 minutes, just zone me out if you want to. That's okay. Because not every sermon deals with things that you're experiencing. And sometimes there are other times when it's more relevant to you than right at the present. And so tonight, I, I guess this lesson is because there's so many, what, I, what they call lament psalms, uh, that somebody needs to at, le at least talk about lament when you talk about the Psalms. Whether it be a private personal lament, as Psalm 13 is, or whether it be a communal lament, like Psalm 79 is. Uh, most of the time, like right now, for most of you, it's never always, because in a group this size, uh, many of us come, let, let's sing the peppy songs, let's make me feel good and walk out of here feeling really good. Let's, you know, uh, when we all get to heaven and sing and be happy and I, I want to sing all that and, because we're feeling good and things are pretty good for us. The funny thing is while you're singing that on another aisle, somebody's heart is breaking on another. And the psalmist admits, this is the songbook of Israel, right? And the song, there's so many of them that are laments. We're crying out to God because we're brokenhearted and we're sad. And I feel like I don't have to fake it and be happy all the time. I think I can come to worship with a broken heart and still feel at home. I don't have to be happy to worship. Don't convey that to me. On TV, you know, you hear the sermons, these people preach, everybody's happy and look on the bright side of everything. And I got to tell you, there's just sometimes where you come to church and you cry all the way through it and you've still worshiped and it's valuable and it's important. And the psalmist wants to know, you're included in worship too. We don't all go around with hangers in our mouths smiling all the time. Okay, you have joy. But you might come with a broken-hearted life at the moment. And you don't feel like smiling. It's okay not to. That joy is still untouched. It's deep down in there because it's permanent and eternal. But right now, you're feeling a little overwhelmed and sad, and that's okay. So if you came after a week of Thanksgiving, counting your blessings, and the week after that, and Christmas is coming, and all you're doing is psyched up happy, okay, you could just sit back and kind of relax a little bit because this sermon really isn't for you. In a sense, I guess, you come together and we sing these songs in defiance. Yes, I've got struggles and yes, I've got bad things. But hey, I've got God and I've got faith and I've got heaven. And we sing in defiance and there's a place for that. But sometimes when people ask you, how are you? And you say fine because you don't want to go on your list of ailments. Sometimes you're flat out lying, aren't you? And sometimes at church, we need to be able to tell the truth. 
So you got this psalm. The psalms are priceless for so many reasons. They evoke reality for everybody, no matter what reality you are. And there are times to lament. And the scripts for this are in the book of Psalms. Because you see, here's the deal. When you are a college football coach and your team's going great, who gets the credit for the greatness of your team? Coach does. The same team comes out the next year and they stink to high heaven. Whose fault is that? Same guy. Same guy, mostly same players. One year you're great, next year you're terrible. It's all your fault. We're going to fire you after we just extended you 10 years. That's how it goes. But you know what? That's what sovereignty is too. If God is sovereign and the blessings come from him, he's also responsible for the junk in my life. Partly, I can't remove him from responsibility. If he's sovereign and truly over all and he's in charge, when things go bad, I can look at him and hold him accountable. Sovereignty must cut both ways. That's what the psalmist says. And so in Psalm 13, you have a guy who's going through a dark period of life. He's experienced a mystery. And mystery and darkness can't be eliminated from life. I don't care how many prescriptions you get or how many counselors you go to. We cannot understand it enough to make it make sense. You can't research it out online and solve your dilemma all the time. But God is somehow in that. You can't censor life. You can't deny life. You feel strange, maybe, when you express some of these things in Psalm 13 to God. When you go straight to his face, and you go straight to him, and you take these frustrations, rather than going somewhere else, you go straight to God. Don't talk about him behind his back. You just go straight to him. And he doesn't domesticate his speech. He doesn't tame it. He just comes straight into God's presence. And God, for whatever reason has no threat, feels no threat from this, and even includes this in the Psalms. And so we're at Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, are you going to forget me forever? Hello, God! Where are you? Anybody ever feel that way? I have people that used to tell me we can't sing that song, Master the Tempest is Raging, the Lord is Sleeping, God's never sleeping. Well, you know, sometimes it sure seems like it. How long, O Lord? you know where I am? Turn on your GPS, God, because somehow you've lost me somewhere. Have you ever feel that way? If you haven't, go ahead and find, I'm, I'm telling you, just tune back out. That's okay. But if you have, go talk to God about that. How long, oh Lord, are you going to forget me forever? How long will you hide your face? Are you hiding? Are you playing hide and seek? I can't find you. I don't know where you are. How long must I take counsel in my soul? I'm sitting here talking with myself because you're not here. And I've sorrow in my heart all day long. I've cried all day. I felt the pain and the weight of aloneness all day. Where are you? You find that sacrilegious to take that into the presence of God and go, God, where in the world are you? We won't do that at church. You'll never hear this prayer prayed as an opening or closing prayer at Valley View Church of Christ. You just won't hear it. But it's a prayer that was uttered, and God saw fit to leave it in Scripture. How long will my enemy be exalted? How long are the, is wickedness going to reign in my life? Why, how long are you going to let this plight take me over? So let me tell you what a, a lament psalm does. There's a certain form that they all take, and that's interesting because I think what the psalmist is telling us is there's a form you should use. You don't know what to do with this feeling of sorrow and betrayal by God or left aloneness by God. Well, here it goes. First of all, there's a plea. This plea means you, you take it to God. You don't let God off the hook. You say, God, you're responsible for, you are involved in everything in my life, and so I'm going to address it to you. You want to be sovereign? Okay, be sovereign. It's your fault. Where are you? And then you say very specifically what your complaint is. And you can go ahead and overstate it. We all do when we're going through sorrow. We're overstating ourselves, but that's okay. You get specific with God and you take to him your complaint. This psalmist says, where are you? You are, vac you are abandoning me. And so he's complaining. And then he starts petitioning God. You're going to see it in a moment. Get specific. I need something from you, God. I, I, I want to speak boldly. I want to give you commands. God, you need to do this. Go ahead and say it. It's not going to hurt anything. Most of us would never talk this way to God face to face. But God wants you to. 
when he's talking about the greatness of himself over against the false gods of the lands around him, he says, you know what? When they go to their gods and they're in trouble, their gods don't say a thing. They don't hear them and they can't respond. But you know what? I love it when you come to me when you're in trouble because you know I'm the one you need to go to. God loves it when we're in trouble and come to him. And so make an appeal, appeal to him on some basis. Maybe it's the basis of God's reputation. If you remember when Moses had to appeal to God, this is what he did. What are the nations going to say about you when you obliterate all your people? What's your reputation going to be like, God? And so you say to that to God, I don't know what your appeal might be. God, I'm not innocent, but I am forgiven. I've, I've repented. I'm a servant of yours and everybody knows it. And this looks bad for you. Now, as we look at Psalm 13 in this, and by the way, you might put a curse in there on your enemies if it happens to be an enemy. Psalm 13. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? Here's the complaint. But notice verse 3, there's a change. After these rhetorical questions, which aren't questions at all, he starts doing something different. He asks three things of him. Consider me. Answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes lest I sleep the sleep of death. Wake me up. Be present in my life, right? Lest my enemies say I prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I'm shaken. I, he's releasing his rage and he's saying, God, do something about this. You know our history. We've had a relationship for a long time. Now I'm asking you to intervene in here. The second part of this is a praise time. Because God always responds to his people. Assurance that you've been heard and sometimes that's all it takes. I just want to know my God hears me. And there's praise that if I've promised him something in the meantime, that I'm going to deliver on it, and there's doxology. And so we see verse 4. There is this pause. Just a nice pause. Like he waited. Like he complained. He went to God's presence, and he, he just let God have it, and then he pauses, and then he says, But I've trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. I will trust. I will rejoice. I will sing. That's what's going to happen as a result of this. God always answers. You see, he blamed God in verse 1. He appealed to God in verse 3. And then he praised God in verse 6. That's what a psalm of lament does. That's the, and you can go through the psalms and you can see a bunch of them put in like this. And I'm just saying, look at these two elements and see how they're developed. And once in a while, when you're in this, when you're in a, a phase of lament, when there's sorrow that's overtaking you and your heart's burdened, go and try it sometime. That must be what God wants us to do because that's what he's left behind for us as his approved means of dealing with our grief and sorrow. God is the context for all of life. He has something to do with everything that happens in our life, and you can't excuse him from anything. If your life is all right, fine, right now, all this has been just as boring as can be. If you're hurting, maybe you're saying, you know, maybe I need to try that. You didn't even know that you could. Lament is healthy. We recognize this when you have a problem with somebody and you go to them and you take it up with them. You go to a counselor and you, you pour out these problems to them and they just kind of sit there and listen and they give you some suggestions. Why is it not the most natural thing in the world to come before the one most responsible for all that happens in our lives and just dump it out on him and say, you fix this mess, God? Why would that be odd? It's simply the awareness that something between God and me is strained a little bit. And so faithful people take their frustrations to a faithful God who is simply big enough to handle it. And judging from the Psalms, God wants to hear us and hear from us in these situations. Just like when you have a problem with somebody else, he wants you to go straight to that person. God says, when you have a problem with me, come straight to me. What's fascinating is it's not just individuals. Just take a look at Psalm 79. I used this once for an entire communal service of, of, of lament. I, I know you can't imagine that, but you know what? There are times when we come into the assembly and we don't need to deny anymore. We don't need to be afraid that the world will come in and watch us going, God, we just don't understand what you're doing in the world because as God's people, we should know what God's doing. No, not necessarily. 
It was in 2005, shortly after that horrendous tsunami hit in the Indian Ocean, that we came together on a Sunday night. We used Psalm 79 as a psalm of lament, and the whole congregation, we just lamented. We just wept, singing songs like this, because there are songs like this in the songbook. Now, some of you may remember these from years, on, years gone by. You may remember those old psalms. Tempted and tried, we're off made to wonder. You, you know, most people, young people today, so that's the dumbest song in the world. But our previous generations all struggled with when we're faithful. Why is it that the people who aren't seem to be better off than we are? You read Psalms and it's full of that complaint and you hear previous generations of people. We're kind of prosperous. We're right up there with the people around us. We're kind of middle class like everybody else. And so we don't really feel that tension as much. But our brothers and sisters from the past really struggled with this. And they wrote a song of lament about it. We have others like that. We sang some of them this morning. But Psalm 79 is not a psalm of an individual. This is a psalm of an entire community. What would be an occasion where the entire Valley View Church would come together and we would lament together before God and worship? We wouldn't sing these songs of feeling good. We'd sing these songs that were heavy, laden, broken-hearted people with something to grieve over, and we grieve together. What would be an occasion for that? Psalm 79. One through four. Here's a description of the, pro, of the trouble. O oh God, the nations have come into your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have laid Jerusalem in ruins. They were attacked physically. They have given the, the bodies of your servants to the birds of the heavens for food, the flesh of your faithful, the beasts of the earth. This is a military uh, 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 defeat they're suffering. They have poured out their blood like water all around Jerusalem. There was no one to bury them. We have become a taunt to our neighbors, mocked and derided by those around us. That was the situation. I don't know what it was. Nobody really knows, but it was very traumatic for these people. And to get together and sing, when we all get to heaven, just seemed a little out of place. Sing and be happy. Just be happy. Deny it all. Be happy. No, because we've got loved ones laying out there dead on the battlefields, and we're coming together at church, and it just doesn't feel like we should be defiant. It seems like what we should do is weep together because we're hurting as a nation. Think there's ever a time like that? Maybe right after September 11th, 2001? So what do you do? Well, then in verses 5 through 12, here's the plea. You'll have the praise, but before you can get to the praise, there's the plea. Notice this. How long, O Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your anger on the nations that do not know you and on the kingdoms that do not call upon your name, for they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his habitation. Do not remember against us our former iniquities. Let your compassion come speedily to, uh, to meet us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and atone for our sins for your name's sake. Notice your reputation's at stake. Why should the nation say, where's their God? Their God's no bigger than ours, right? Let the avenging of the outpoured blood of our servants be known among the nations before our eyes. Let the groans of the prisoners come before you. According to your great power, preserved those doomed to die. Return sevenfold into the lap of our neighbors and the taunts with which they have taunted you, O Lord. This, by the way, cannot be transferred to any battle on the American army. This is not the same as just any nation's fight. But there might be something that affects an entire nation, a community, even just Jonesboro. What could happen that would cause us to open up our doors and say to people, come and lament with us. We're just going to plea, open up our hearts and make an, a plea to God for Him to come and, and sustain us. What would be an occasion for that? And then finally at the end, there's the praise and it's just one verse. And I don't know if the trouble's over or not, but what they know is they've made their appeal to God and God has heard. And they trust that God's going to do something once they inject him into the situation. And so, but we are your people, the sheep of your pasture. We'll give thanks to you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. No matter what happens, God, we're going to be here and be faithful. I come home and 
I hear the report that, 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 that the Devereaux family heard, I'm going to be lamenting. If I experience what some of you experienced just this week, with trials in your family that were really ultimate weighty things, I'm going to lament. I'm not going to necessarily blame God, but I'm going to say, God, you're sovereign. And I'm going to bring this to you. Do something. And then I'm going to wait and trust that he is. And I'm going to be ready to praise him when he does. That's what Christians do with their sorrow. We don't deny it. We don't look at the world and say, uh, we don't keep it secret in here and say to the world, oh, we're fine, God's taking care of us. We sometimes say, I don't know where God is, and I'm wondering myself, but I'm staying right here and waiting on him to reveal himself. We've got a genre of, lit genre of literature in the Old Testament that allows us to do that. And God feels so honored. You just can't miss this in the Old Testament. He feels so honored when we feel overwhelmed and instead of going everywhere and yonder looking for some way to assuage the pain in some bottle, in some drug, with some counselor, with some this or with that, we simply go to Him and we cry to Him. And it's not structured and it's not polite and it's not sweet and it's not all tamed and domesticated by running it through the mill of niceness we just come to him and we're blatantly honest and we open up that wound and we say God you're partly here you're in this mess what are you going to do about it and God loves it when we do that so do that when the need arises that's how you learn to lament may we be God's people who are totally honest with life and let God really be sovereign over all our lives every bit of it because when we become children of him and he is our lord he wants to be lord of all our lives the good the bad the pretty and the ugly and not only does that mean that he wants us to give all of our lives to him it also means that when everything happens our natural reaction is to take it to him yes in a season of thanksgiving and joy give him the praise and the thanks he deserves it but in the moments of lament and grief take that to him too he wants it all that's the benefit you get when you become his children there's not a part of your life anywhere he's not interested in you need to respond this evening if you want to make, give your life over to him and let him be lord of your life say his name and for the rest of your life he'll be saying yours and you'll be grateful in every moment of your life. You need to respond, make it known as we stand and sing to encourage you.